Tashitele to everyone joining us on the live stream. Um, I'm offering you uh, this uh, milk tea from the Buddha's begging bowl that contains the milk of bodhicitta, the un unceasing milk of bodhicitta. Um, and I uh, wish you a long life, Tashitele. Um, Milarepa had said <clears throat> that regarding the perfection of method, um, that when every when um everything um that you do um becomes uh, becomes virtuous um then um everything you do uh, becomes a skillful um, method and uh, becomes a feast offering um and so uh, this is uh, a way to accumulate merit a method to accumulate merit where, wherever you go so when you look at this begging bowl you are re recollecting the three jewels at the same time. You are remembering the Buddha, it's the Buddha's begging bowl. And you are remembering the Dharma, and because the Buddha's teachings are the teachings on bodhicitta. The 84,000 Dharma teachings have their root in bodhicitta, or loving kindness. And milk also flows from loving kindness. So through this begging bowl, you recollect the Buddha you recollect the dharma which is love you recollect the sangha because you remember i am a sangha and what am i supposed to do as a sangha i must cultivate love for sentient beings a sangha must possess immeasurable love so i'm a sangha i must have love for all beings so the buddha's begging bowl is a method to recollect the three jewels and therefore, it, be it becomes a skillful method to accumulate <coughs> merit. So this is how I accumulate merit. And I'm sharing this with you just as a reminder. That's the dialect to everyone. Mm. <laughs> Nato,アメリカ用のポークサチャルで、ちょっと待ってみて、用のを聞いて、このメニューを聞いて、用のを聞いて、用のを聞いて、用のを聞いて、用のを聞いて、用のを聞いて、用のを聞いて、用のを
So this milk tea that I'm offering to you, it's not that it actually reaches your um, actual <coughs> mouth, uh, but the milk really is the milk of loving kindness. And love is really that is, is what is all pervasive and what will reach you. <coughs> For example, if I'm in America and there is someone in Tibet um, who loves me, then when I talk to them and they hear my voice, we hear each other's voice, tears start to flow, no matter how far we are apart. Love still goes there. It's important to know that. So love is in the mind. And it is represented by the milk. For example, when a mother loves her child, then milk naturally flows. But it's really the milk that comes from the mind. For example, even an animal, in an animal, milk naturally flows. The animal doesn't have to think, I need to make milk. It just flows naturally out of great love for the child. So therefore, it is said... A lo the love for all sentient beings is the all-pervasive power. And what we call the Dharma is love. Um, so uh, in a prayer it goes, however many sentient beings there are, they have a mind, and this mind is all-pervasive. And wherever this mind pervades, the mind of all beings, love must pervade them. Um, space is endless, and so is the mind. The mind is all-pervasive. And this all-pervasive mind must pervade with love and compassion, with immeasurable love. That's very important. And this is how we accumulate merit. Merit really means, to accumulate merit means to eliminate self-grasping. And the more love you have for others, the more the self-grasping, the ice block of self-grasping will melt. <coughs> and when the ice block melts, your own mind is the Buddha. When the ice melts, it becomes one with the ocean water. So accumulating merit brings benefit to yourself and others. When you give rise to love for others, it is your own greatest benefit. So this is the recollection of the three jewels. <laughs> Tetsi Sanjay Oh, <laughs> ああ、カレー
So last week at um, a Seattle Center organized um, a program on the Great Compassionate One. And I gave teachings on really most of this practice. There's just some uh, in, very important part actually that was left out and was not mentioned yet. And it's not okay to leave something out so that needs to be mentioned. It's also very important. And that is why we made time today, Dharma friends, for me to introduce you to those missing points, because they are extremely important. And so first, uh, the old tantric system condenses all the classes of tantra, of the new system, into one. So we have these two systems, the old and the new tantric system. Even though there are two systems, they have a single enlightened intent. And the enlightened intent is summarized into the, what is called the four nails that bind the life force. It is said that the deity lacks a concrete inherent existence, therefore visualize the deity like a rainbow in the sky. Some people who do believe in the concrete existence of appearances think that the deity really exists. There is a real concrete deity. Or today, a real person is giving us teachings. But this view is a little bit mistaken. Appearances appear, but they lack inherent existence. So the they team should be understood to be the Samboga Kaya. <coughs> it is said that all phenomena have the nature of the three Kayas. The Dharma Kaya is like space, and all the Buddhas dwell within the space like Dharma Kaya. And then the Samboga Kaya appears like a rainbow in the sky. There might be um, hundreds or thousands of different deities appearing. There are all kinds of different sadhanas and rituals. There are the old tantras, the new tantras. There are four classes of tantra and so forth. There is a great multitude of different practices. There are many different empowerments, many different deities. And often it becomes so extensive that one doesn't really know what exactly to practice, actually. That is why it's important to understand, to gather um, the essence all into one ultimate meaning, one ultimate result. The Buddha had said in the sutra that I have taught um, the sutras in thousands of worlds, and although my words are distinct, their meaning is the same. If you practice the meaning of my words, you practice them all. And so of those four nails that bind the life force, this quote uh, should be understood to mean or refer to the nail, the unchanging nail of meditation, the changeless nail of meditation. And so what is the benefit of understanding this nail? 
then one will know that even though there is this great multi multitude of sadhanas, of rituals, of deities, one will understand the single essence of them all. An ordinary beginning practitioner will find it difficult to navigate their way through a multitude of different sadhanas and practices. Even though they do have devotion, they don't really know what exactly to practice. And then they see a certain deity and think that this is the deity I need to practice. And they regard the deity more like a friend. Like, this is my friend, um, and this is not my friend, for example. And this kind of perception is actually a huge mistake. Because the deities are not like that. So the way we should understand it is in terms of the four nails that bind the life force, and within that, the unchanging nail of meditation. Um, so that is according to the old tantric system. In the new tantric system, that is the introduction of Mahamudra. In the Ganges Mahamudra text, the Gangama, in the beginning, um, it says Mahamudra Upadesha. So Upadesha is the, a Sanskrit term meaning piss instruction. Even though there are, might be millions of deity, they have a single life force. So that's the piss, like the piss instruction. Or endless samsara and nirvana has a single basis. So that's the piss, or like the piss instruction. But when you understand the piss, then you become very relaxed. Then you know that all of samsara and nirvana, all this multitude, all has its essence in the mind, arises from the mind. And that is the unchanging nail of meditation. So I myself, through the blessings of having received many great lamas, I have gained some understanding. And basically, I just leave it with this understanding. I do not have a lot of experience. I just share my understanding. But I think that if I'm able to uh, put my understanding into the ears of sentient beings in samsara, they might understand because there are all kinds of um, bodhisattvas, different forms of bodhisattvas within samsara. And therefore, some, when they hear these words, may just naturally understand. And so because I believe it to be very beneficial, and that is why I really make an effort to, to share these words with you. Uh, <laughs> Chukai Sogdom Tata 
ते हा कोण काढे फे मागोळ काढे फे ते हा कोण थे थमचा वाढ घेऊन काळे जाऊन राहणार काळे जाऊन राहणार आता ते कधी चालू सै तोळो डवा जेव्हा जेव्हा नंग सो जेव्हा मे बाहे हे तरी शेर खांग जमीन लिहिजे जेव्हा दे ते असो तरी दे माती जमीन नसो म्हणे लाजी ठाकूर जाव जे जमीन जे दिसा माझे जे जे जेव्हा मे बी दिसा ते काढे येता सेम लांग सेमे लोगे नंगळे ओळे नंगळे साडे दृष्टी जम गे ओळे दृष्टी जम बोध येता जे मला ते हा कोण सुना तरी सैला थम तेरे सुमारे हे तो हा कोण मेगा ते कोणते मोळे ते हा मो वाज तरी सांजे एकदम दिन देखे सगळी थमते सांजे रे ओमच्या छावळोम छा तुमची छावळोम जाऊ पे ते लागे शो जोळे ते जाऊ छावळोम तुम्ही जाऊ तुम्ही तुझे थामचे गोवा काढले ओ डोळा डो सेम ती थामचे साजे जोळे सेम रिचे चमज सेम ते रागती डोवा ताया दाजे निधी ताया की चे बरो ते काळे कथा होते तर जिमफिंग लोक ताग ओळे ते डो तहम खोवा छाव तुम्ही ती जर नाही बेपाचे ना तुम्ही खिफं जेठे जे तुम चा सांचोक सेमन दो थांबो ते कुठं सांचोक सेमन दो तापाथे मे पण दे तापाथे मे पण तिरे तरी तोंडा मुद्दे माथा दिस मे पे इशी ते नामची इशी रे तरी जे मनाडे पे नामची माथा इशी थाऊ नामची दे दाजी जी ओळे नामची जी काढ दाजी जी गाजी दाजी जी ओळे इशी दे नामची रंग दे नामची दे नाम खाता वो कोस तरी पे साजा छे बोध साजा छे बोध सला तो मांजी रे ज्या छे बोध खोजे जी छाप सोंदे ताथे जे मे सो मे दाजी छे जे मे सेम नाम का सेम तर नाम का छे मे छुक रंग दे गोमा जेर तावे जेम थामे थामो तावे संग गोमे तावे मा चेरम तरी चुमी जे जंगे दे का थमो गंठे जंगे थो साजे को थारे साजे लाम थारे थारे डोरे ते रात्री चौदम झरते दिसेल हो तरी ता था नि ओळे ते पेल ते ते हा कोळचे तरी लाल नांग रामजी मे पण त्या हा कोच ओळे सो वी हॅव सेट दॅट ऑल फनॉमेना हॅव द नेचर ऑफ द थ्री कायस वी ऑलवेज मेंशन दॅट एम सो अगेन ब्रीफली द सिक्स रॅम्स ऑफ समसारा are actually near manakaya and then the dharmakaya is the ground the dharmakaya is like space and within this ground the basis of dharmakaya even a million buddhas are one in the a prayer for excellent conduct the aspiration prayer for excellent conduct it says the within a single atom there are um as many um um buddhas as there are um sand grains in the river ganges all the buddhas after three times they uh, can be present within a single atom along with their um qualities of enlightened body speech mind activities and qualities all of these can be present in a single atom so when condensed everything can be present in a single atom and when um expand that then there are millions and billions of um buddhas there is myriad samsara and nirvana so we need to understand um how to expand elaborate but then also how to condense it all into a single ground and that is everything arises from the mind everything gathers back into the mind therefore the omniscient longchen rapcham had said when you realize the nature <coughs> of the mind there is no need to um study the scriptures and also milarepa um said something that basically means the same um so um basically all the teachings are in essence uh, must must be summarized back or come back to the words of the buddha and so do those four nails that bind the life force so Uh, regarding those four nails that bind the life force in the um, tantras it says 
so for example, if you have a thousand different uh, water bodies in the world, you have one sun and one moon in the sky and a thousand different vessels of water. So uh, an ignorant person will think that because they see the moon reflected in each of these thousand vessels, they will think that there are a thousand different moons, a thousand different suns. But then one day when there is an, an eclipse and it says when Rahula then eats the, the moon, then the moon is basically obscured. Uh, there is a, a moon, a lunar eclipse. You can't see the moon. Then when one moon is eclipsed, a thousand, the moons in the thousand water vessels also disappears. So this is an example of a, a piss instruction. So ultimately, it all comes down to the, the single mind. And all phenomena have the nature of the three kayas. <coughs> On the 37 practices, it, it is said, appearances are one's own mind. From the beginning, mind's nature is free from the extremes of elaboration. When you realize the nature of your mind, you will instantly understand the nature of all of samsara and nirvana. So a person who has realized the view, the nature of the mind, they have actualized the unchanging nail of meditation, which is the principal one of those four nails. And the first one to understand in order to engage in the practice of the secret mantra of the Vajrayana. So what's the benefit of understanding this changeless nail of meditation? And what's the benefit of not, or the harm of not, not understanding it? If you understand it, your mind will become free of doubts. You will know exactly what to practice. You will understand the meaning of the deity. The deity, although it appears with various implements and ornaments and so forth, even though there are myriads of these deities, they all have a single life force. And that is the, the meditation, the unchangeless nail of meditation. Also, a similar um, quote that points to that is in the Sirkangma, the Golden Temple um, prayer, um, and it mentions the, um, the changeless um, abode and um, palace wherein Buddha nature dwells. And also in the practice of the fivefold path of Mahamudra, it says, um, unless um, you, uh, um, you, uh, the, the, you, you you must visualize your form as the king unlike um, they team, um, in order to attain the um, changeless, uh, uh, like royal um, seat uh, of a king. And so there's this changeless um, seat is the mind. The mind is changeless. Even though there might be um, millions of deities, they all are subsumed within Buddha nature. And all deities arise from this ground. So that is the piss instruction that is so important to understand. The Buddha also said, all sentient beings are actually Buddhas. They are only temporarily obscured by adventitious stains. So temporarily sentient beings have become like ice blocks. But the ice block has to melt, to merge, to become one with the ocean water. So what is the understanding that we should take from all this? It is that all sentient beings in the six realms possess Buddha nature, the cause of attaining awakening. And that is because they possess a mind. And there is no sentient being who doesn't have a mind. It is just that they have to purify the obscurations from their mind. They have to purify the dualistic thinking of self and other. And what's the way to purify dualistic grasping? it is to cultivate the altruistic mind. So that is the first thing that we need to understand. And then within that, we need to practice bodhicitta. As it is said, the 84,000 Dharma teachings have their roots in bodhicitta. So first we need to understand um, that everything arises from bodhicitta. We need to cultivate immeasurable love. When immeasurable love arises, as a result, we will naturally see the ultimate truth, that is, non-dual primordial awareness. 
and then the ordinary consciousness will transform into primordial wisdom. As Mila Reba had said, I see no consciousness, I see primordial wisdom. Consciousness here refers to the dualistic mind of self and other. And wisdom is that when you look at the nature of this consciousness and you see its nature, you see its space-like nature. And so then it becomes, it transforms into primordial wisdom, or we call that Mahamudra. And this term Mahamudra, so in Tibetan it is Chakya Chembo, and Chakya is the, is the seal, the mudra, and the Chak, the first syllable, refers to emptiness, and Gya, the second syllable, it means that um, samsara and nirvana um, is a, a, an endless space. So pervading all of samsara and nirvana. There is no self and no other. There is nothing to grasp at within the space-like empty nature of the mind. So that is the dharmakaya. And in the dharmakaya, all are one. This is what we call the view. And the view of those four nails is the unchanging nail of meditation. Jigme Lingba had said that first you need to seize the view and that is really the nail of meditation. And because if you engage in generation stage practice that in deity yoga, not on the basis of the view, then faults and qualities arise from that. You might gain some temporary um, CDs or some uh, accomplishments but still you are very far away from enlightenment. And therefore, it's important to base one's deity yoga on the view. And the view is represented by the fourth nail, the unchanging nail of meditation of these four nails. If you have this, then you become very close to the state of Buddhahood. Uh, so uh, what we need to understand here is when we practice a deity, is that the deity, while it appears clearly, it lacks any inherent existence. Uh, <laughs> で、まれて。てれ、心ば、てば、ねばすん、俗よれ。かえけとくる単語、単語とくとくてべ、単語とくてべ、特技でてれ、単語とくてべ、単語とくてべ、単語とくてべ、単語とくてべ、単語とくて
Dante, So the day team clearly appears, but it lacks any substance, just like a rainbow in the sky. So those who grasp at the concrete true existence of the deity, they may still wonder, like, how does it really appear like a rainbow in the sky, and, and what's really the benefit of this? And there's many doubts in their minds. So th that is because they are fixated on there being something that is real, a real thing that's actually there. And that is because that is due to their a karmic imprint of grasping at a concrete existence. So uh, that is a mistaken way of thinking about it. The deity possesses the qualities of omniscience, love, and power. So first, the deity has arisen out of the Dharmakaya through a mind of bodhicitta. So first we need to understand the power and the benefit of such a mind and also the harm of lacking such a mind. So this rainbow-like form of the day team, we too actually possess a rainbow-like form. When does that manifest? For example, when we are in a dream state, when we are dreaming, we have a dream body and this is what is called an impure, illusory body. The deities, on the other hand, possess a pure, illusory body. The pure, illusory body transcends birth and death. It is unchanging. It is always present and all-pervasive. The pure land, such as Deva Chen and so forth, and the myriad deities, always naturally exist. So now, in our dream state, when we dream, we experience all kinds of suffering in our dreams. All kinds of fear arises in our dreams due to the karmic imprints present in our minds. Sometimes uh, we experience fear from water or of um, fire, of hunger and, and thirst, heat and cold and so forth. 
So why do we experience fear in our dreams? It is because of self-grasping. Self-grasping is what creates the impure, illusory body. And also after we have died, we will possess such an impure, illusory body, which is also like a rainbow. So therefore, it is very beneficial to now recognize the, the dream state. There are actually some practitioners who have recognized the dream state. And then immediately when fear arises in the dream, they will know, oh, this is just a dream. For example, we have had several retreatants in lab team who have been able to recognize the dream state. And only through will appear, but then they will instantly disappear again. And so these karmic imprints, where do they actually come from? They arise from self-grasping. And as an antidote to that, we practice the deity, we visualize the deity, for example, Chen Rizik, and we recite Omani Padme Hung, Chen Rizik's mantra. And without any doubt in our minds, we visualize Chen Rizik, knowing that this is my true nature, because I possess Buddha nature. And Buddha nature is only obscured temporarily by self-grasping. If you cultivate bodhicitta, the four immeasurables, when you just think in a, for one moment, may I benefit all sentient beings, in that moment, there is no self. And ultimately, no self really exists. Also, ultimately, karma is empty on the ultimate level. But due to the fault of self-grasping, we experience great fear in our dreams. When we become free of self-grasping, we may recognize the dream state. For example, in the midst of a dream, you might recognize that, when, for example, when you are burned by fire or you are drowning in water or falling off a cliff, you will know that, oh, this is just a dream. There's not, nothing to be afraid about. So there's some who will recognize that, and that is due to the quality of knowing the, the Holy Dharma. So the mind can not die. The mind transcends birth and death. And when the body dies, the mind continues on. If we have accumulated negative karma, then these corresponding karmic imprints will continue on. And over and over again, we will wander anywhere in the six realms of samsara. In the very beginning of the 37 Bodhisattva practices, um, it says, um, Jinrezik strives single-pointedly for the sake of sentient beings. Um, so um, thinking of sentient beings, the deity arises. And the deity arises out of great love and compassion for sentient beings. Uh, so, for example, if you practice Chen Rezik and uh, um, if I practice Chen Rezik and I recite the Mani Mantra, um, and I recognize that this is my true nature because of Buddha nature, I really am Chen Rezik. So, actually, all those males with love, with compassion, are Chen Rezik, and all females with com compassion are Tara. I actually always mention that. So the Buddha again said, all sentient beings are actually Buddhas. So if you understand that, you will understand the power and the benefit of practicing the deity, of visualizing the deity. Um, and you will <coughs> recognize the suffering uh, when it arises in a dream state. And so the suffering that we experience in a dream state and later the bardo are one and the same. In the bardo, we will have an impure, illusory body. If we have not purified our self-grasping, then we will not be free of these karmic imprints in our mind. And, um, and that even exists in the minds of uh, bodhisattvas. There are some bodhisattvas who have gone to the, the hell realm, but then very quickly have become liberated again from the hell realm. Um, there's, for example, a story from the Buddha's past lives where he hit his mother with a, a shoe. Um, and then, as a result, he was born in the, the hot, um, like, um, in a hot iron pot in hell. Uh, but then instantly, 
um, upon birth there, um, he, he like basically bounced um, out of it again and was released. Um, and that, but that was through the power of bodhicitta for the other hell beings. Uh, so you can read more about that in the Buddha's life story. But in brief, as it is said in the 37 practices, all suffering without exception comes from wishing for one's own happiness. So when you really think about that and you gain an understanding, you will understand that this is how it really this is really true. What is so precious is bodhicitta. In a moment of bodhicitta, self-grasping is absent. The ice block of self-grasping is melting into water. And so then you can understand the meaning of the deity clearly appears, yet it lacks any substance, any inherent existence. And actually, we also lack any substance. We also lack inherent existence. The difference is that the deity does not suffer, uh, whereas we experience suffering. So we need to understand the, the practice to be an antidote to the cause of suffering that is self-grasping. Mm. Nan Mother, Tell
Tati, Naga Dadi Colote, Verdin Manutuna, Sidi Dana Batato Chula, Topata Neva Kareci and Matela, Dalam Tobacco, Tanga Toro de Harcola, Tati Dali so demon so many, no the same Pachama Java, to the two way government, maybe a Magarmajor, Ragging of tea, leg day, Nati or Tam Tea. Oh, Chula was Dangi Karena, Tela, Topa, Mibata, Piba Metera. どうせ Um, so this is this verse here, by the way, on page 21 um, in our Wretched Rizik Sadhana. The deities appear but have no inherent existence. Visualize them to be like rainbows in the sky. And uh, so we understand um, that to be similar to the dream um, state. Um, so um, in the um, dream state, we assume this impure illusory body that also lacks any inherent existence and those who don't recognize the dream state will experience all kinds of suffering in the dream but if you recognize that it is a dream then all these uh, different difficulties we experience in the dream all suffering will just collapse will crumble so now we have these karmic imprints in our minds and we will bring those with us into the bardo. So there is this danger that we are taking these karmic imprints with us into the bardo. So as an antidote to that, we practice mani and chenrezik. And as an antidote to that, you can make it a practice to uh, think of chenrezik and recite the omani Padmehung mantra as you fall asleep. And then the very moment you wake up from your sleep, Instantly, you should be able to remember Tenrezik and the Mani Mantra. Um, if you can do that, then also later in the Bardo, you will not grasp at me, but instead remember the deity. And in this way, the Bardo will be recognized as an, a state of illusion. And so it's important that when you wake up, that this thought of me does not arise. So that is the, the benefit of practicing the deity. When you think of the deity, the moment you wake up, we think of Tenrezik in an instant and recite the Mani Mantra, then all your day-to-day -day activities will also become virtuous. And you continue to remember the Mani throughout the day. Um, and so there is no need to... As you go about reciting the Mani Mantra, there is no need to even think much, conceptualize much about um, the benefit um, um, or harm and so on of, of doing a practice a certain way. Um, just keep an awareness of Chenrezig and recite the Mani Mantra. So the deities appear but have no inherent essence. Visualize them to be like rainbows in the sky. And so when that is in internalized through your practice and later in the bardo, you will recognize the illusion-like state of the bardo. It's important to really have a firm um, trust in that. Then there will be no suffering in the bardo. If the ordinary karmic imprint is not purified, then you will experience suffering in the bardo. So then the next line says, the mantra is the empty sound of absolute reality recited without grasping like an echo. Uh, so the sound of mantra is also called the um, empty natural sound of dharmata. It is the, the unborn um, sound that arises on its own. So it's not the ordinary sounds that we hear, for example, when we hear a conversation, but it's the sound that arises from the ground. Uh, for example, at the time of death, all the perceptions of this life come to an end, 
And once they have come to an end, there is this sound that arises, and that is the sound of the fundamental ground. And that sound is actually, can be heard now too. Now some call that sound um, a, 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 an illness of the winds, a wind imbalance. So it's the sound, it sounds a bit like um, a, a cymbal, like a ringing in the ear. Uh, some think it's uh, an imbalance of the winds, uh, but actually it is the empty, natural sound of the dharmata because it does not rely on anything. It, it, it arises naturally. And uh, so uh, normally when we grasp at sound, we are placing imprints into our mind, imprints of sound. So we, we, for example, when you hear something pleasant, when you're praised, then you're happy, you grasp at that. Or if you hear something unpleasant, you, you're blamed, then you feel, I have an aversion against that. So again, you're grasping. When you recite the Mani Mantra, then you will not grasp at ordinary sound, whether it is praise or blame. If you do grasp, you're forming an imprint of speech in your mind. And that imprint will be carried on into the bardo state. So as an antidote to that, we recite the deity's mantra. So again, as an, an, as an antidote to grasping at form, we visualize the form of the deity, the illusory form of the deity. And as an antidote to grasping at sound, we recite the deity's mantra. And in this way, we purify the impure illusory body into the pure illusory body. Then later, after we have died and we come into the bardo, we will experience the pure illusory form. So actually, um, dying, uh, the deep sleep state and the bardo are one and the same. Or there are those three instances when we come to the natural state of the mind. That is during sexual intercourse, at the time of death when the consciousness transfers, and in a deep sleep state. During these three times, we come to Buddha nature, the fundamental ground. And when you recognize it, you see the ultimate truth. Um, and so during, <coughs> at the time of death, when, um, you, when a mind falls unconscious and all has dissolved, you then may awaken within the state of the Dharmakaya. And so that is something we can train in while we are alive. If there is a lack of recognition, then when you wake up from sleeping, you will think, I have slept. Instantly, there arises this concept of me. And again, you experience um, grasping and suffering. Um, or in the dream state, you experience all kinds of fear. Um, instead, when you go to sleep, remember the day team. And the moment you wake up from sleeping, uh, again, try to remember the deity and the deity's mantra. And so that, that is the reason why we practice the deity um, day and night, and we recite the mantra day and night, so that later in the bardo we can awaken um, within that state of the deity. Because when you awaken from your sleep state, and you awaken from within Buddha nature and instantly remember the deity, it is like putting on a clean pair of clothing. And then you carry that with you into all your activities. And then all your activities will become without grasping. So that is why we uh, practice uh, the Chinresic and the Mani Mantra continuously day and night. So again, whenever um, when you go to sleep and when you wake up from sleeping, the moment you wake up without a single other thought, instantly remember Chinresic and the, the Mani Mantra. And it is said that then all your daily activities will become virtues. So that is the reason why we recite the mantra. And again, the mantra is also called the, the empty natural sound of dharmata. So as an antidote to the grasping at the body, we visualize the deity's form. And as an antidote to grasping at speech, we recite the deity's mantra, the mani mantra. And when there is no grasping at speech, then no matter what other people say to you, it will not affect you in any way. 
whether, whether others praise you or blame you, there is no grasping in your mind. And if a thought arises, you should recognize instantly, I have become confused. So in the 37 practices, it <coughs> says in the end, in brief, we should, not, we should be aware of all we do and place no karmic imprint, no further imprint into our, our mind. Um, it is said that a sensible person, a wise person, is not overjoyed when praised and is not dejected when blamed. From this, many qualities arise. So when there is no grasping in the mind, then um, all sounds heard will not affect you in one or the other way. So in brief, it's important that you do not place further habitual karmic imprints into your mind. And in order for you not to do that, you practice the deity. In order to not create further imprints of the body, you visualize the deity. And so as not to create more imprints of the speech, you recite the deity's mantra. And so the mantra again is the empty sound of the, of the Dharma Tam. The sound um, that arises when there is no grasping within the mind. Dati Lichi uh, the um, so um, the uh, sound of the mantra is the natural empty sound of Dharmata. 
And so therefore in the uh, old tantric system, the Nyingma system, the mantra is generally chanted in a very beautiful melody and very slowly so that we can really actually become enchanted by the sound of the mantra. When we recite the mantra very slowly in a very beautiful melody, then the mind becomes enchanted by the mantra itself. And in this way, we purify the imprints of grasping at speech. There are some who consider the number of mantras is most important. They, they try really hard to complete certain numbers of mantra accumulations. But then at the same time, their mind often is just distracted outward. So actually, when we recite the mantra, the mind has to <coughs> be there, immersed in the mantra. <coughs> and when you recite the mantra very slowly in a very beautiful melody, the mind becomes immersed in the sound of the mantra. And then the mind will follow along the mantra. And so that is why it is really good to hear the sound of the mantra continuously, day and night. Also, when you go to sleep, you can hear the recording of a, of a mantra. Then the mind is always there naturally. And whenever you hear that sound, the um, obscurations of speech will become purified. Otherwise, if you don't, um, if the, if you don't chant the mantra, you don't hear the mantra in a beautiful melody, and the mind becomes um, distracted outward. But when the mind is immersed in the mantra, it will not be distracted. And when the mind is not distracted, you will purify karmic imprints. It is just like reciting the mantra, hearing the mantra is just like putting your clothes, your dirty clothes in a washing machine. The more you leave it in there, the more clean the clothing will become. That's why the mantra is also very similar um, to a mantra, like a, a prayer wheel that we spin. When you spin the prayer wheel, the mind stays there. Actually, the spinning of a prayer wheel is a method to practice virtue of body, speech, and mind simultaneously because the mind is focused on the turning of the, of the wheel. And in this way, then therefore, the three obscurations of body, speech, and mind are simultaneously purified. So reciting the mantra in a beautiful, or chanting the mantra in a beautiful melody and slowly is very important. And so if you're really still set on reciting a certain number of mantras, you can also um, still recite the mantra slowly, but with, um, um, with each kind of um, um, syllable, for example, you chant like om ta re tu ta re tu re and so on. And so with each om ta re, then you count one beat, and so very slowly. And as you go around the whole Tara mantra, you have gone through a number of mantras already. So this is how you can also use the counting of mantra together with the slow, beautiful chanting. Um, but it's most important that there is no distraction. There are actually um, some who very quickly accomplish the deity in a very short amount of time because their mind um, is not distracted. And so accomplishing that the deity, practicing the deity, means that you have to purify the obscurations of your mind. And if your mind is somewhere else, then the mind is distant, is far away from the deity. Um, and then it is difficult to, uh, to purify um, all of um, the, the karmic imprints within your mind. So the key really is to be single-pointed and without distraction. There, in, the, in a text on the benefits of the mantra garland, it says that there are some who accomplish the deity in a single day, and then there are some who accomplish the deity in a year, and there are some who accomplish the deity next lifetime. So it all depends on the level of one's samadhi, one's, one's absorption, uh, one's concentration. Uh, an example of someone who has accomplished a deity in just a day is, for example, Che Mipam Rinpoche, who, when he was in um, Lhasa, um, and he um, practiced um, in Desakang, he practiced the, um, the um, Maitreya um, um, Sadhana, 
And um, so during this this one um, day of um, of practicing, there was this like seed of uh, Bali uh, that um, began to um, sprout um, within this um, short period of time. And uh, so anyway, some uh, many stories about that and it would take too much time. Uh, but uh, in brief, if the mind is single pointed as you practice, you are purifying your obscurations. When, so when the mind is focused single pointedly on the deity's form, you are purifying physical obscurations. And when the mind is single pointedly focused on the mantra, you are purifying sp <coughs> verbal speech obscurations. And so in this way, the mind naturally remains impure. But that's why it is very important to always hear the sound of the mantra. In your home, for example, you can play the mantra on a as a recording on the loop. So you hear it all the time, also when you go to sleep. Whenever you hear the sound of the mantra, you are purifying obscurations. So that is why the chanting of the mantra slowly in melody is very important. で、セブンデブでセブンカリネドテレスな。セブンデ。え。セブンマイムゴンネ。セブンコランギリンデテキンボセミエリサジェジン。セブンタンマタンジャンデレサジェジンのよまり。でサジェジンマタルデディ。
Uh, so then next we come to the mind. Uh, so again, we um, have said uh, when you visualize the form of the deity, all appearances as the deity, and then all um, grasping at ordinary speech um, is ceases. Uh, ordinary, ordinary form ceases. When there's no grasping at um, sound, when you recite the mantra, then all um, ordinary um, imprints of sound cease or of the speech become purified. And then regarding the mind, um, in the text it says, the mind is undistracted, non-meditation, place it in a state of empty appearances, free from grasping. Uh, <clears throat> So the mind, um, the mind is Buddha nature, and it is said primordially the Buddha. Then the mind is without any grasping, in, in a state of undistracted non-meditation. The mind abides in its completely clear natural state, and that itself is the Buddha. There is no other Buddha to be found elsewhere. Therefore, it is said in calling the guru from afar, I have not recognized my own mind to be the, the Buddha. Or as you mentioned before, this is then when we recognize that this is when consciousness transforms into primordial wisdom. That is when you realize the nature of consciousness, it transforms into primordial wisdom. And Whenever you realize your true nature, your mind begins to abide like space. When you recognize that self and other do not exist, you realize the space-like nature of the mind. So understanding that uh, leads to realizing that. And once you've realized that, you always should abide within that state, that state that is unchanging. It is called the state of Vajradhara, beyond birth and death, the space-like, unchanging nature of the mind. So it all depends on um, letting go or not letting go of dualistic thinking. But when you realize your true nature and you let go of dualistic thinking, you will become free of all doubts. Doubts, actually, Magic Lapton, Magic Lapton said in the Chut teachings when she taught the four Maras according to Chut, um, doubt is the Mara of self-deceit. Um, so without distraction, so it says here the mind is undistracted, non-meditation. Without distraction, clearly look at your mind. So in an instant, in a fresh moment of awareness, look at your true nature without any distraction. And whatever thought arises, do not cling to that thought, but sustain a state of non-distraction. If you begin to follow a single thought, then it is like you're letting the water fall down and it melts somewhere into dirty earth again. So without um, non-meditation, without thinking, is that to just rest without any concept in the space-like nature of the mind that is clear and empty. And this clear and empty state is very blissful. So through the practice of calm abiding, shamatha, you come to the state of insight or vipassana. So without distraction, without meditation, meaning that there is nothing separate to meditate upon aside from just looking at your own mind, that is like space. When you rest in a space like nature of the mind, the mind becomes very um, relaxed. So as you settle in this relaxed state, when a thought arises, you do not pursue this thought. You let it be as it is, and it will disappear just like a wave in water. However, if you follow a single thought, which is just like a small wave, 
then this small wave will turn into a huge wave, like a mountain. So you let those small waves be. When a small thought arises, you let that thought be. <coughs> thoughts will arise. So thoughts will not just disappear. Thoughts will arise, but you, will, you let them be naturally as, them, as they are, without altering anything, without doing anything to them. You just remain clear, with a clear mind, an undistracted mind. And the thoughts will subside on their own like a wave on water. And then in that state, you will decide, you will gain certainty, ascertain that primordially my own mind is the Buddha. So that is the meaning of there is non-meditation. So you simply sustain a state of mindfulness and awareness, clear and empty. The clarity aspect is the yap or the male, and the emptiness aspect is the yum or the female, also often depicted as Samantha Bhadram, yap and yum. When you are in a um, thought-free state, you experience great bliss. As you mentioned, there are those three instances when you come to the actual nature of the mind that is inherently blissful. So that is when you engage in sexual intercourse, when you're in deep sleep, and at the time of death <coughs> when the consciousness transfers. So there are instructions um, on the, the path of skillful means that introduce us to the nature of the mind in those three circumstances. So what we need to recognize in death without arising and without decline. It always remains as it is. So when you practice the deity from within that state, then um, you, as you, you visualize yourself as the deity, so you are the Samaya being, then half of your mind already is the deity. You already trust that uh, at least half of my mind is the deity. So in this way, you're becoming close to accomplishing the deity of recognizing that my own mind is actually the, the Buddha. As you mentioned before, um, so far I have not recognized my own mind to be the Buddha. So that is, the mind is undistracted non-meditation, uh, meaning that uh, you simply need to maintain, sustain a state of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. まあ、ゴンバイネヒサ、ゴンバイネヒサ、ゴンバイネヒサ、ゴンバイネヒサ、ゴンバイネヒサ、ゴンバイネヒサ、ゴンバイネヒサ、ゴンバイネヒサ、
寝ろと俺よく言われて、寝ろかなってあれ、それ寝ろかな、一日はめばで、その、それちょっとでもらったら、そんそこ言われ、えー、えー、せめて、それ聞いてもらって、やってた、さあ、見るんで、しぼりちゃあ、そん、えー、それで、はたけしてもらい、それが、ごめんなさい、さあ、で、入れてたら、ね、さあ、ろんなっちゃったら、ちゃあ、ろうよりあんなっじえろね、えー、さあ、じゃちっちゃけ、ばって、チェヨレ、ラロロワンガジェルテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテレテそれとさ、たぶんペイグル、ドロンシェゴレイ、サミ、オンゲテイラトンディティルマジョ、ドロンヤコジャゴレイ、トリジオヤコトゴレイ、ドロンソパゴレイ。And then, so we're on page 22.、Uh, it says,、uh, one, should, one should know this key point of non meditation. So, the key point of non meditation is that there is no sort of separate meditation that one needs to meditate upon, aside from just looking at one's own mind, looking at one's true nature that is clear and empty without any thought whatsoever. So, even though phenomena appear, appearances will manifest. Do not、uh, grasp at them to be real or unreal. The moment you grasp at them in any way, a thought of attachment or aversion will arise. So do not grasp at them in any way whatsoever. Don't think about them in any way. Kempo Munzer Rumbache said when he taught the three words that strike the vital points, al、um, although it clearly appears if you do not grasp, You purify birth in the form realm. So, when you do not grasp at appearances, you will recognize them all as illusory by nature. And you still continue to engage in activities of samsara and nirvana. It's not that you become, in a way,、um, senseless and you, you, you don't think about anything anymore. You, you do、um, think about the things that you need to do, but You do not grasp at the reality that this is real、um, at whatever you do. But whatever waves appear, you let them be without accepting or rejecting them. And then no thought of attachment or aversion will arise.、Uh, so that is, one should know this key point of non meditation. And then it says, which leads to the great state beyond the intellect. Free from activities. So, free from activities. When you rest within the natural state of the mind without distraction,、uh, the mind, you become effortless.、Um, so, as it is said in the 37 practices in the, in the beginning,、um, the mind doesn't come and doesn't go. When you recognize the space like nature of the mind, once you have recognized this nature, continue to simply abide within this state. And then、uh, this leads to the great state beyond the intellect, which is free from all activities. Now we call that state the state of Mahamudra or the state of Dzogchen, the nature of the mind. And then whatever action you engage in, whatever you do in the Dharma or in the, in the world, whatever arises, happiness or suffering, whatever feeling arises in your mind, you will recognize it. As confusion, as lacking any true existence. If you become caught up in appearances, you will create further karmic imprints in your mind. You create negative karma, which leads to suffering. If you recognize, then even though you do experience the results of your own karma, if you do experience suffering, You will recognize it to be a purification of negative karma.、Uh, so, that actually also is a sign that there are karmic imprints still present within the mind that need to be purified. 
So then when you recognize that, you will be heedful so as not to create more karmic imprints for the future. And whatever arises, you will recognize it as illusory, like just like a dream. So when the mind becomes effortless, there is no grasping in the mind. You neither grasp at the existence nor the non-existence of any appearance, and you simply remain within the natural state of the mind. So then in the Samantha Bhadra prayer it says, then even though the three realms were to be destroyed, there is no fear. There is no attachment to the five desirable sense objects. That itself is the state of Buddhahood. That is this um, royal seed of the unchanging ground that we need to attain. And when we practice any deity, any sadhana, um, this is how we, we engage in its practice. First, there is the generation stage where we visualize the deity. And then in the end, on the, the resultant level, is the completion stage. And all completion stages are the same in nature. They all are, um, they all um, teach on the nature of the mind. So when you look at the nature of the mind um, and you see your true nature, you will be able to see all phenomena, all appearances as illusory or dreamlike by nature. So that is why these words are, are really very important. This is why this practice is very important. And that is why at Gar Monastery, for instance, this practice has been engaged in continuously for at least the last 500 years, except for um, during the Cultural Revolution, um, when was like a barbarian overtake. During the year of 1958 and 81, there was a brief interruption of the practice, but um, also now um, the practice is ongoing continuously. And this is also where we get our money pills from. They are consecrated during um, this practice at our monastery. And that is why these money pills that are distributed are extremely precious. Uh, so, Dharma friends, this is what I wanted to share with you today. And I did so to the best of my abilities. There may be some, some things that I, I don't know. That, which is why I encourage you to again and again discuss this with each other, also with your spiritual teachers of various lineages, various traditions. It's just very important that you do not just let it be with having received these teachings of what I said, but that you also discuss that. Um, especially this topic needs to be discussed a lot. Um, so um, therefore, it's really important to have discussion groups. Oh, my Thank you, everyone who joined us on the live stream.